How are we doing? Good? All right. Well, as we continue in our movie series today, Captain America. And, you know, before Captain America came to theaters, probably most casual superhero fans didn't know a lot about Captain America. And before Jesus came to Earth, which is what we celebrate at Christmas, probably most casual fans of God didn't know a lot about uh, living life with him. Uh, today, I want to share with you uh, two things that I've really liked about Captain America and his movies. And, and one thing I really didn't like, and interestingly, they all illustrate uh, really important truths about doing life with God that we learned from Jesus and that I think a lot of us probably don't quite understand. So if you don't know much about Cap, which is what the, the cool kids are calling him these days, uh, let me kind of fill you in. So Cap starts out as a, a weakling named Steve Rogers, who looks kind of like that. He, he's a runt of a guy, but he's got a huge heart. He, he wants to be in the military, but he's too small to make it or to make a difference. He, he's just not powerful enough. Uh, but to combat the evil in the world, the government has been doing some biological testing to see if they can genetically alter soldiers to make them superhuman. And Steve ends up being enlisted in this program, so they inject him with super soldier serum. Try saying that like three. You, you, seriously, try super soldier serum, super soldier serum, it doesn't work. Uh, super soldier serum, and boom, like his muscles start to grow. He gets taller and faster. He's more athletic. He looks kind of like this. Okay, not like this, like that. And it doesn't hurt that he gets this for me? No, no. It, it doesn't hurt that he eventually gets this uh, like awesome uh, shield that's made out of like indestructible metal. And, and he ends up becoming this American war hero, uh, someone everyone looks up to because he represents the very best of what we hope to become. So uh, C. Rogers wanted to do good, but he didn't have the power. And, and then he was given super power. And he was finally able to do everything he wanted to do and more. I wonder if you've ever felt like Steve Rogers. Maybe there are some things that you want to do in life. Uh, maybe it's become a better person or, or really live your life for God or really make a difference. But, but you feel like you just don't have the power. Well, I would say that you're right and that it's not a problem. Uh, on Christmas, we celebrate God coming to earth and being born as a baby. It's Jesus. And, and because of uh, Christmas, God was now with us. He was like living and walking on the earth. And, and so Jesus grows up from a baby and, and he, he proves that he is God uh, with us. And, and he teaches people all about life with God and, and how to do that. And, and it was so awesome for all the people to have God here on earth with, with us. But but, but then Jesus started saying like some weird things that made people kind of raise their eyebrows. Like, like he said that he was going to leave, but that it would be better for us if he left. Huh? I, I want to show you, we're going to look at a bunch of verses in a book called John in the Bible today. It's one of the books of the Bible where we learn about Jesus. If you have a Bible, you can turn to John. If you have a Bible app, if you don't have a Bible, no problem. We'll put all the verses on the screen for you. If you don't own a Bible, we give them out for free at the Velcro bar. So uh, here's Jesus saying it's better for us if he leaves. John 16, verse 7. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. So, so Jesus says, I'm going to go, but I'm going to send someone. I'm going to send the advocate. What does the word advocate mean? It's someone who represents you, someone who fights for you, right? And then Jesus explains in a few verses later who this advocate is. Uh, verse 16. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. 
So, so Jesus says, this one I'm going to send you, this advocate, is the Holy Spirit who will be in you. And the Holy Spirit is God's presence, God's power inside of us. And, and then Jesus starts making um, what seem to be outlandish promises based on this very idea that his followers would have God's presence, the Holy Spirit, inside of them. Like, look at John chapter 14, verse 12. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. Huh? It's like, how could we do greater things than Jesus did? Well, he would say it's because of this Holy Spirit inside of us. And so later, Jesus is crucified, and then he resurrects, and, and he gives his followers their mission. His followers back then and today, the, the mission is uh, that we are to be good news everywhere we go to everyone we meet, and we're to share the good news, the, the good news that God loves us, that, that Jesus came for us, that he died for us. And Jesus makes it clear repeatedly, nothing is more important than you going and you being the good news wherever you go and sharing the good news whenever you have opportunity. Okay? But then Jesus tells them not to go. Huh? You just told us that we need to go. And he says not to go. Check it out. In a book called Acts chapter 1. Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus is like, nothing is more important than you going so you can be the good news wherever you go, and, and so you can share the good news, but don't go. Don't go in your own power. Don't go until you have the Holy Spirit, God's higher power. And so what we learn is that being strong isn't about my power, it's about higher power. The, the Holy Spirit is God's presence in our life, it's God's power in our life to help you live the life that God wants you to live. And listen, if you're not a Christian, like, like maybe you're here, but maybe you believe in Jesus, maybe you don't, maybe you believe in Jesus, but you haven't really committed your life to him or to following him maybe you're not completely sure but you're here checking things out man this is good news like like you, you should be like oh ah, this is good news because perhaps one of the things that's held you back from becoming a christian is the the thought that you could never really live the christian life maybe you're like i i just don't think i could ever be good enough. I don't, I don't know that I could overcome temptation. I, I don't think I could consistently do good. Well, the Bible would say, yeah, you're right, but, but it's not a problem. God knows that you can't do it, and he's not expecting you to do it. That's why he offers to you, if, if you would just say yes and invite him into your life, his presence and his power, his Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And if you're not a Christian yet, that should be really good news. It's like, it's not your power. It's his higher power. If you are a Christian, this is also really important to know. What this means is that you are never alone. You're never alone. And that God's not asking you to do life, to do the life he wants you to live on your own. Becoming a Christian is not about uh, trying hard to live a good life. That is not what it's at all. Being a Christian is not about trying hard to, to live for God. It's not what it's about at all. Being a Christian is about being in a relationship with God. A relationship with God that is so intimate, he literally moves inside of you and he gives you his power. So it's not about you trying harder. It's, it's about you staying connected to him so that you're living life in his power. And Jesus teaches us here that being strong isn't about my power. It's about higher power. Now, I want to tell you something else important that Jesus taught us that I think a lot of people don't get. But first, let's go back to Captain America. Uh, when, when I first got the idea of Captain America, kind of a little bit knew who he was, I, I, I thought I wouldn't like him. 
Like, I, I thought it just seemed like he, maybe he was a goody two-shoes, you know? Like, you've got a superhero like Batman. Batman's got a lot of personal issues, and so I can relate to him in, in that sense, at least, But but I because I got issues. But I thought that Captain America, like, I, I thought he was supposed to be, like, this perfect guy, so perfect you would not want to hang out with him. Like, the kind of guy who never shows any emotion, he never gets stressed, he never gets upset. But watching the Captain America movies, I realized, oh, no, I, I actually like him. He, I mean, he's good. He stands for something. Uh, you can trust him. He's got integrity. He's good. He, he does good things. But he, he's not a goody two-shoes. No, he, he's like a real kind of guy, real emotions. And we, we see that in movies, and I thought, oh, okay, I, I could be friends with him. I wonder what you think about when you think about Jesus. Maybe uh, you know or don't know a lot about Jesus, but, but probably one thing you do know is that Jesus was good, and that he asked people to, to become his followers, and he wants his followers to be good. And so if that's all you know, you might assume that you wouldn't really like Jesus and that maybe he wouldn't like you. Maybe he's so perfect that you wouldn't want to hang out with him, and you're so imperfect that he wouldn't want to hang out with you. But, but, but if you would just read the, the, the biographies of Jesus' life in the Bible, there's four books devoted to that. What you would realize is, oh, I like him. Like, he's good, but he was not a goody two-shoes. In fact, one of the most fascinating things you'll read about Jesus is that everywhere he went, the most sinful people in that town wanted to hang around Jesus, which is weird, right? Like, like sinful people don't want to hang around a goody two-shoes at all, but Jesus wasn't. Like, he was a real guy. We see him have real emotions, and we see him laughing, we see him get stressed out, we see him upset, and everywhere he went, everyone wanted to be around Jesus, except for the goody two-shoes. They didn't want to be around Jesus. So like there's this uh, one time in the Bible uh, where we see this wedding. Um, has, has anyone ever had to put together the, the wedding, the list of people to invite to a wedding, the guest list? Like that is not a fun endeavor at all, is it? Because you, you, you start out with everyone but then you have to narrow it down to the amount of people you can actually afford to invite. And so you have to start making decisions like, well, I, I like him, but his wife, she's kind of a jerk. Or, or um, he, he's a cool guy, but not when he's drunk. I don't know who we want him when, he, when he's drunk. Or, or like, oh, they're, they're, they're a nice couple, but they're kind of gross when they dance together. They're like, yeah. That's not me dancing. I look good when I dance. That's this, you know that couple, right? And, and so you start narrowing the list down, and you end up with a, with a list of people that you like and your relatives, right? It's like, man, they're, they're coming. And so the, the non-relatives that you don't like, they're off the list. They're not invited. Well, we see this wedding in the Bible in that same book, John, chapter 2, and uh, Jesus was invited to the wedding. Which is interesting, right? Like, it's just another example. Jesus wasn't a goody two-shoes. If there was a party, people wanted Jesus at the party. And he wasn't just invited. He went to the party. A goody two-shoes might not go to the party. You don't know what's going to happen at a party. But, but Jesus went to the party. And, and let's check out what happens in John chapter 2. It says, the, the next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. And why he said that is he had not yet done a miracle. Okay? He's lived about 30 years, no miracles. Uh, but, but check out what she says. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. They each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. But when the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine... 
Not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you, you have kept the best until now. The mirac- this miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Back then, weddings and wedding receptions were a really big deal. Like a wedding reception, the party, would last an entire week. No joke. And and the family would, of course, provide the refreshments for the the guests. And wine was very important because in their culture, wine was considered a symbol of joy. So if you were the host and you failed to provide adequately for your guests, it would have been an absolute social disgrace. People would have remembered, like it could have literally haunted this couple uh, for the rest of their lives. So in the, the urgency of this situation, Mary goes to Jesus, informs him of what's going on, and what does Jesus do? He becomes good news to the party host. He instructs some uh, workers to fill six stone jars with water. It's probably about 120 gallons. And he turns that water into wine. A lot of wine. Like if you're pouring four ounce glasses, that's about 2,000 glasses of wine. And it's good. Like the people are like, this is the good stuff. Like why have you been holding out? See, Jesus wasn't a goody two shoes. He, He entered into the normal experiences of life. He was present even in the potentially sinful experiences of life. Jesus wasn't a goody two-shoes. He was good news. That's what it means to be good. You're good news. He was present in the normal experiences of life, and he transformed them by his presence. We, we see that over and over, whether it was turning water to wine or healing the sick or feeding the hungry or loving people on the margins or, or taking the punishment for the, the sins that we deserve to die for by going to the cross in our place. Jesus was good, not a goody two-shoes. He was good news. If you're a Christian, man, this is so important to know. Because Jesus teaches us that being good isn't about being a goody two-shoes. It's about being good news. Being a Christian does not at all mean that that you become holier than thou or someone who acts kind of pretentious or or very moral or better than everyone else. No. You, you, You don't avoid hanging out with people at your job because they're telling bad jokes or, or, or wish you had a job where you could work in a Christian environment or, or, or not go to the, the hanging out at your friend's house or the office party because it's being thrown at a bar or, or make everyone feel guilty because you're there with them. No, being good isn't about being a, a goody two-shoes. It's about being good news. Jesus wasn't just present at the party. He didn't just attend it. He transformed the party by his presence. Everywhere Jesus went, he made a difference by being there. And that's what it means for us to be followers of Jesus. That's what we're supposed to be like if we follow Jesus. So we hang out with people at the job, and their lives are different because we work there. Like, maybe because we're the only person who really listens to them, who, who is positive and gives them hope. We are good news to our coworkers. We're good news at the get-together, at the party. We give the perfectly timed encouragement or the small unexpected gift. When, when someone is struggling, we invite them to go over to Starbucks and, and get some coffee just so that we can listen to what they're going through. We identify with a person who no one else notices, and we show that person attention. In my, my cul-de-sac, like, I don't know about your, where you live, but no one even says hi to each other. Like, we ignore each other. And so last week, my wife and I went door-to-door to the 20 houses in our cul-de-sac and invited everyone to come to our house tonight for a Christmas party uh, because we're supposed to be good news in our, our neighborhood. We're good news. If you are a follower of Jesus, I would ask you, are you good news? Do you, do you bring good news wherever you go would the people who know you say that their lives are better because they know you 
Jesus was good. He was not, not a goody two-shoes. He was good news. And, and if you're not yet a Christian, oh man, do you need to know this. This is so big, but, but because maybe you know that Jesus was good, and so you assume he was probably a goody two-shoes, and, and, and so you figure that you probably wouldn't really like Jesus, and he probably wouldn't really like you, but man, no. That, that is, nothing could be further from the truth. There's a, um, an author named Donald Miller. He has a book called Blue Like Jazz. And in, in this book, he, he tells a, a story about a friend of his named Penny. Uh, Penny had a, a very rough past. Her, her parents got divorced. Her uh, mother was a, a drug addict and went crazy, ended up homeless, living on the streets. Well, well Penny had absolutely no interest in religion at all. Her, her perceptions of Christians, mostly just from what she had seen on TV or heard on the radio, was that they were just narrow-minded hypocrites. And she felt like their views on humanitarian issues were opposed to her views on those same issues. She, she said this, she said, if Christianity were a person, like if you could somehow take all the Christians and lump them together into one human being, she was sure that that human being would not like her. Well, at one point she went on a three-week week trip to France, and in France she met this girl named Nadine. And um, they, they struck up a friendship, and Nadine just really cared about Penny, uh, cared about her past, listened to her stories from her crazy childhood, and that led Penny to want to ask questions and listen about Nadine's story. And one night they were walking on a beach in the south of France, and Nadine explained to Penny that she was a follower of Jesus. She said uh, that she believed, her view from reading the Bible, was that Jesus was a revolutionary. He was this humanitarian of sorts, and that God had sent Jesus to a world that had broken itself to bring healing to the world. Hearing that from Nadine really frustrated Penny, because she had always been able to just dismiss Christians because they all seemed to be insensitive nuts, but now there's Nadine. It really bothered Penny that Nadine was a follower of Jesus because she couldn't understand how someone that kind and that accepting and that loving could also be a Christian. But, but they stayed friends, and over the next year, Nadine, uh, the way she lived out her Christianity in front of Penny, it just continually intrigued Penny. But Penny began to wonder if, if Christianity were a person... Maybe that person would like her. Maybe she and, and Christianity actually would have a lot in common. Maybe they'd get along. And so over the next year, they, they stayed friends, and the two of them would have long, late-night conversations about boys and about school, but they would always end up landing on the topic of God. Eventually, uh, one day, Nadine asked Penny if she would be willing to read one of the books of the Bible with her and talk about it as they read it. And, and so she asked her to read this book of, called Matthew, which is one of the biographies of Jesus' life. And, and Penny said yes, and they read it together. And, and later, Penny wrote this. We would eat chocolates and smoke cigarettes and read the Bible which is the only way to do it, if you ask me. <laughs> Not sure about that, I don't know. She said, we started reading Matthew, and I, I thought it was all very interesting, you know? And, and I found Jesus very disturbing, very straightforward. He wasn't diplomatic, and yet I, I felt like if I met him, he would really like me. I can't explain how freeing that was to realize that if I met Jesus... He would like me. I never felt that about some of the Christians on the radio. I always thought if I met these people, they would yell at me. But it wasn't that way with Jesus. There were people he loved, and there were people he got mad at, and I kept identifying with the people he loved, which was really good because they were all broken people. The kind of people who are tired of life, the kind of people who just want to be done with it, or, or they were very desperate people, or, or people who were outcasts. Soon, Penny came to believe that Jesus really is who he said he is. That he was God himself come to our world to save us. 
And she decided to give her life to him and to, to follow him. You know, it, it's interesting. Penny had thought that if Christianity were somehow just one person, if, if all Christianity could be lumped into one human being, that it wouldn't like her. And what's ironic about that is that Christianity was a person, Jesus. And he does like Penny. And he does like you. And man, you would like him. He is good. He is not a goody two-shoes. And if you're a follower of him, that's what it means to be a follower. We're not goody two-shoes. We bring good news everywhere we go. One, one more thing I want to share with you that I've learned from Jesus and that um, I, I think a lot of people just don't get. But before we do that, let's just go back one more time to Captain America. So in the latest uh, movie, Civil War, how many of you saw the latest one? A yeah, bu bunch of you. Um, we, in this movie, all the Avengers show up, which I kind of felt like Captain America got his movie stolen from him, but whatever. And so the Avengers are this all-star team of superheroes like uh, Iron Man and Hulk and Thor. And, and, and in the movies prior to Civil War, they have done a really good job of of saving the world but it hasn't been without consequences because while saving the world uh, they have just tore apart New York City Washington DC uh, Sokovia and in Civil War uh, this leads the the United Nations to uh, to say that the Avengers have in some respects actually made the world a less safe place to live and so the UN decides that they are going to give the Avengers a boss and some rules and some accountability and that if they will not accept this, they will force the Avengers into retirement. I have no idea how you get the Hulk to retire, but that, they didn't talk about that. But, but some of the Avengers are like, this is fair, it's, it's smart, it's a good thing, we should, we should follow. And some of the Avengers are like, absolutely not, this is wrong. And so they divide into two groups. One is led by Iron Man and the other is led by Captain America. And, and as they debate, this world emergency arises and the, the question becomes, can these two groups decide, uh, continue to, to work together even though they disagree with each other on this issue? And the answer is, not really. No, not, not really. And, and that is the one thing that I, I didn't like about the Captain America movies. I, just, I watched it and I thought, come on, if, if the world needs to be saved, what are you doing fighting amongst yourselves? You're on the same team. It's something I didn't like about this latest Captain America movie. But man, it's something I love about Jesus. I, I love, so, so Jesus calls his followers to come together as a team. A team that today, today we would call the church. And he gives his team a mission. It's a unifying mission. Okay? To, to be and to share the good news with the world. What, what, what's interesting is that the original followers of Jesus, uh, the, this group that he brought together, could have easily become one of the most divided groups in the history of the world. Uh, like, for instance, uh, Jesus initially chose 12 followers who would be, uh, he called them apostles, they would be kind of the leaders of his movement. We, if you were here last week, we talked about that last week. Um, so at the time when Jesus is doing this, the Romans were ruling the world, including the Jewish world. Uh, they would come into a town, they would kill off any Jews who opposed their authority, they would slaughter thousands of people in a town, and all the rest of the Jews who were willing to accept their authority, they would tax, like 80% of your income, 90% of your income, and, and that money would go to, to um, provide money for the Roman army so they could go to the next town and kill off more Jewish people. The Jews hated the Romans. There's not a strong enough word for it. They hated the Romans. So at that time, Jesus chooses 12 guys to be his leaders. One of them was named Simon the Zealot. Okay, if you, if you read, remember last week, we saw Simon the Zealot. Zealot was a term given to a Jewish person who was trying to violently rebel against the Romans and restore Jewish independence. They were violent insurrectionists against the Romans. Another one of the 12 was Matthew, the tax collector. 
Matthew was a Jewish guy who, when the Romans came into town, sided with the Romans and took a job with them, collecting the Jewish people's taxes that would be used to fund the Roman army so that they could kill more Jews. <laughs> Jesus could not have chosen two people with more potential for division. I mean, these two guys did not agree on everything. They, they, they agreed on basically just about nothing except that they were now on the same team, on Jesus' team, and his mission unified them. And then uh, these new first churches start getting birthed. And man, uh, in these churches, you would have rich people and poor people who became a spiritual family. Nothing like that had ever happened in the history of the world. Like study history. Never had rich people and poor people been brought together in the same, the same community until Jesus Church. Uh, in, in a time of slavery, which it was, slaves and their masters would stand together side by side and worship God together. Nothing like that had ever happened in the history of the world. Jesus and his mission unites people who would never, never be united under any other circumstances. Jesus taught this all the time. What Jesus taught, and it's, it's so critical for us to understand, is that being a team isn't about uniformity, it's about unity. You don't have to line up on every little, you don't have to agree on every little thing, but you do need to be unified under Jesus and his mission. He, he taught unity all the time. So like in um, John chapter 13, verse 35, he says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So he's like, love each other and the world will take note. Uh, and then in John 17, we get to overhear Jesus praying to his Father in heaven, and he's praying for his followers. And what Jesus prays for when he prays for us is unity. Look at John 17, 11. He says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that, here's his prayer, they may be one as we are one. And then a couple verses down, he says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus emphasized unity. But, but listen, he didn't demand uniformity. Okay, it's not like you have to agree with the person sitting next to you on every little issue. No, the, the, the mission, the mission of being good news to the world, of sharing the good news with the world, of saving the world is bigger than any of our differences. And so you don't, you don't have to line up on every little thing. Like when your mission is saving the world, you do not let differences uh, divide you or distract you. No, you, are, you are united by the mission and you work together to accomplish it. If you've been coming here for a while, you, you probably have seen up here or met uh, Jake Cack. Jake is another one of the pastors on our staff. D do you want to know what Jake and I agree on? Not much. N not much, really. Like, like, there are political issues that we disagree on. That, that's okay. Jake is wrong. Um, <laughs> that there, there are biblical issues that we disagree on. And that's okay. Jake is wrong. Uh, there are like, how do you do church in the best way issues that we disagree on. That's okay. Jake is wrong. Jake roots for Notre Dame. That's okay. Jake is sinful. I'm just saying. Jake and I disagree on a lot, but you know what that means? Nothing. Nothing. I love him. I love working with him. The things we disagree on are minor. They, they don't really mean anything. But what we agree on is major, and it means everything. Because we agree on Jesus and the mission that he's gave, given us. And, and that unifies us. And being a team, it's not about uniformity. It's about unity. And it's so sad when, when you hear about churches that divide over, like, what style of worship music we should use or what color uh, carpet we should put in the lobby or some obscure theological issue that's, you know, barely in the Bible or, or uh, just personality conflicts. It's like, why? Why would you let a disagreement over something so minor that doesn't mean anything get in the way of what is major and means everything? 
It's okay if you, if you don't disagree or if your personalities don't match it, if you have differences of opinion, because being a team isn't about uniformity. It's about unity. It's about unity. The mission that God has given us, this mission of being good news to the world, of, of sharing the good news with the world, of, of saving the world, is much bigger than any of our differences. So, what we learn from Jesus illustrated in these movies, being strong, it's not about my power. It's about higher power. Being good, it's not about being a goody two-shoes. It's about being good news. And being a team is not about uniformity. It's about unity. And I, I want to leave you this. Uh, which of those do you most need to learn from Jesus? Which of those most need to kind of change the way you've been thinking or, or doing life? Perhaps uh, you, you need to stop doing life in your power and try and, and instead start plugging into his higher power. Or do you need to realize that, man, Jesus really likes you and you would really like him? Or maybe you're a follower of his, and you need to, to, to understand that means that we are good news wherever we go. It doesn't mean that we're good news anywhere we go. Or, or maybe you've been focusing on uniformity, and it kind of bothers you because it's like, well, I don't agree. With, with, but, but you need to, to learn to accept differences and instead just focus on unity, the, the unity that Jesus' mission of love brings to us. So, so let's do this. Let's pray together right now. And let's ask God to help us to learn the, the one that we need to learn and to start really applying it to our lives. Okay, let's pray. God, when I, um, my, my kids kind of dragged me to see Captain America movies and I was like, I don't, I don't really know anything about Captain America. And, and who cares? Like, like, it's really not a big deal. You go through life and not know anything about Captain America and no big deal. But God, so many of us, I think, misunderstand things about you and doing life with you, and that is a huge deal. So God, would you help us today to understand that, that we are not, you are not expecting us to try hard and live a godly life, that you are expecting us to connect with you and not to use my power, but higher power to live the life that you have for us. That you are uh, not asking us to be goody two-shoes who are more moral in our lives or more put together than everyone else. But instead, we're, we're supposed to be good news everywhere we go. Our presence makes a difference in our neighborhood, at our job, on the kids' soccer field, everywhere we go. God, would you help us to, to, to really understand that it's not about uniformity, it's about unity. We need to be united with people who uh, call themselves followers of yours. And we need to be plugged into our church enough that we really have that sense of unity and, and team with other people. God, thanks for sending Jesus and thanks for the Christmas uh, holiday where we can remember that you came to show us how to do life with you and to love us and to die for us. And I pray all these things in his name. Amen.